Konnichiwa. And this, ladies and gentlemen, will probably be the only thing I'm going to say in Japanese for this lecture. Unfortunately, it's a very beautiful language, but I don't speak it sufficiently to be able to lead a conversation. Today's lecture could be part of our country lecture, but it isn't, because today's lecture will focus on a very remarkable person. It's a f story of a rather fantastic person and his fight for education in his home country, Japan. This headline, as you see, contains and Europe and then something in an Asian writing. This word is Nihon, the Japanese word for Japan. And it actually exemplifies quite well that we do have, to say the least, some differences culturally. This is the person in question for this lecture. Shigeyoshi Matsumai, he was a remarkable person. He was a socialist, as you can see on the slide. He survived World War II, which is in itself quite remarkable, since he was being punished by the then Japanese government for opposing their policy. He, was, he declared publicly his resistance against the policy of the then Japanese government, and they punished him immediately. He was sent to the front line, and he survived that. He was also a part of the system for some years, and that is the direct reason he couldn't benefit from being opposing the government after the war. He was punished for it, which uh, is ironic, but he was. So he was, uh, he was denied the possibility of teaching for a number of years after the war. He founded a number of institutions in the Tokai, Tokai education system, and he created his own education system based on a notion of educating the whole person. Now, where have we heard that before? He was inspired by Pezzolozzi, an Italian theorist. Actually, he was Swiss, but he was a part of the Italian community. By Albert Schweitzer, also Swiss. Ta -da, there's a pattern here. And by our good friend, Grundtvig. And this is where it gets interesting, because Shigoshi Matsumai is our direct link to our way of thinking education. <coughs> a bit further on Dr. Shigoshi Matsumai, he was born on October 24th, 1901 in Kashima. The father of him was the chief of a village, Kashima town, in the township of Kumamoto. He had an elder brother, Akiyoshi. He became a pharmacist and he was a judo champion. Ooh, and it, that is quite important to be a judo champion. Uh, a big part of Shigeyoshi's mindset was the combination of mind and body. And one of the ways you could do that is by applying martial arts. Bem please notice that it's not just called how to fight, it's called martial arts. To them it's an art form and it expresses um, your control of body and mind. You use your mind to control your body and make it do what you want. And today, Shigoshi Matsumai's son is the leader of the Tokai University. So, he has set quite some high standards. And uh, he's also managed to create a system that can be passed on to others. That in itself is an incredible achievement, especially given the conditions in Japan in connection with World War II. Now, how did all this come about? That's a good question, actually. Shigoshi Matsumai, he graduated in 1925, and he graduated as an engineer of electric, an electric engineer. Somewhere around the, these lines, he attends a lecture by Hirabashi, Hirabayashi, sorry, who held some lectures on the Danish education system. Hirabayashi, he studied in Denmark from 1924 to 1928. And he actually translated quite a few Danish works into Japanese. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
Further, he meets Ushimura Kansu, and then it, it sparks an interest in Denmark because Kansu has always had some quite strong sentiments and feelings about the Danish schooling system. What was it exactly that appealed to them so much? Well, we'll, we'll come back to that, but there was quite a, a clear link between their ways of life and our ways of life, at least in their, in their view. Matsumai, he went to Germany as a, I don't know if we can call it an apprentice, he wasn't an apprentice, he was, he was done with his studies, but he went there uh, on behalf of the Japanese government to find out how were the electric engineering business doing in Europe, and what, where, where to go better than Germany. Uh, Germany had Siemens, and Siemens was one of the world leaders in electronics back in these days, 1933. There were other quite <laughs> strong reasons for him not choosing America or the United Kingdom. And the reason being that the Japanese government in its day had severe problems with anybody else for that matter, except the Axis, the powers, the Axis powers, which cons were consisting of Germany, Italy, and a little later on, Spain. Um, when he was in Germany, he went to Denmark. He used the opportunity, went to Denmark in 1934. He returned to Japan in 1935. And from then on, he started developing his ideas on education. But, as you know, the war came. He had to think, also, uh, think otherwise. He had to adapt to the situation. In 1942, he founded his university. In 1944, I believe it was, he was sent directly to the front line for opposing the Tojo government. The war ended quite abruptly and violently, as you also know. And in 1945-46, he was Minister of Communication and Education in the new Japanese government. Now, that is what I call a good recovery. What was it with Shigoshi Matsumai and Gondui? Well, as you know, he traveled to Denmark in 1933, following his, German, his journey to Germany, where he visited Siemens and factories. He gets the opportunity to go to Denmark in 1934, and he stays quite a while, visiting quite many people and quite many high schools. The interesting thing is here, <clears throat> we see him as the direct adapter of Kondui. He was definitely not. He was something else. He was someone who observed Kondui, observed his idea, his uh, ideas, made note of them, and took what he could use for Japanese conditions. I think he did quite right. So he was a big fan of the whole man, body and soul, to be educated as a whole. That is not a thing that plays any big role for Kondui. He was convinced of Kondui as a spiritual guide based on religious strength. So in his mind, the reason for Kondui's success was the fact that he based all his things on a Christian message. He did it with Christian values and he emphasized Christianity in his teachings. So it was the Christianity of it that was the strong point of Kondui's thinking and teaching in Matsumai's view. So, as we've already talked about on previous occasions, Kondui he was a big fan of no exams, learning through debating groups, and testing via seminars under supervision. Books are for recording knowledge, as you can see on the slide. And that is not what we see in any Japanese education to system today, in any of their schools. They do exactly the way they do it in anywhere else. They apply exams to measure, and they make sure that you have a teacher who gives a lecture, and if you pay attention, and it's your responsibility to pay attention, you'll be a better student. That radically uh, differs from Kondri's thoughts. He may have a point, though. How to transfer a whole nation? How to transfer an entire nation away from, this is how we usually do it, to, oh dear, we have to do it differently. 
how to, to redefine mindsets. That's difficult. So I can understand that rather than trying to revolutionize an entire society, he takes the bits and pieces he can use and applies them to a Japanese context. And he does it very successfully. Now, here comes what to me is also quite important. Context. <clears throat> As you may recall from my lecture at Tokai University's European Center in Lübeck, I mentioned context. <laughs> What context are we referring to here? Well, to me, there are some significant numbers in this, in this story. Firstly, he leaves for Germany in 1933. In 1933, lots of things happen that has a huge impact on the world. Firstly, as you can see on the slide, the Japanese foreign minister, Yusuke Matsuke, leaves the League of Nations together with the rest of the Japanese delegation, never to come back. That was a breaking point. Secondly, a rather persuasive man with a strange mustache, a quite significant haircut and a way with words, takes over in Germany. You may know of him. If you look at, uh, at the top of these two pictures, you have one of his advocates, good old Mr. Josef Goebbels. That is, of course, Adolf Hitler. Hitler takes over. And that is a system change in Europe, in mainland Europe, that really can be felt and heard all over the world. Again, this happens in 1933. Meanwhile in Denmark. Now, and this is also very significant. What happens in Denmark at the same time? For very, very interesting reasons, we do not have a right-wing revolution in Denmark. Could have happened. 1933, that's only four years after the big, extremely violent Wall Street crash, where the world is being thrown out into a turmoil we can hardly imagine. Everything goes, pardon me, my French, tits up. Everything goes wrong. Economy breaks, breaks t totally breaks up. And we have no idea what to do. What happens? Governments around the world start saving. Oh, we better cut costs. Companies start cutting more costs. How do you do that? You fire people. What happens? If you fire someone, they have no money to buy anything. What happens if they don't buy things? Companies close. That's exactly what happened. You set a chain of events in, in motion that gradually screwed up every economy in the Western Hemisphere, and the Eastern for that matter, because of course it had an impact on the, others, uh, the other economies as well. But in Europe it was very hardly felt. But in Denmark, no such thing happened. And why? That is the big question here. Here we have one of those very rare, unfortunately, examples of political courage. What happened was that all, almost all the political parties in Denmark s had a get-together, sat down around a table, got themselves a beer, and laid out the foundation for the modern welfare state. What are the, basic, uh, the basics in a modern welfare state? You take care of people. And that is exactly what happened here. They made sure that anybody out of a job could have welfare support. It could be helped in, terms, in times of need. Nobody else had that. Sweden very, very quickly followed in 1935, but we, in 1933, introduced one of the most liberal social reforms in the world. And as a direct result of this, we did not have neither a revolution nor a violent right-wing move, which could be two, factor, two sides of the same case. Thank God for that. But that is also in 1933. Now we come to 1934. What happens in Germany in 1934? Well, Mr. Shigeyoshi Matsuma leaves for Denmark. That's one thing. Another thing would I, which I find interesting is that in Germany in 1934, Hitler kills all who opposes him. Not all, but very many, especially inter internally in his party. It's called the Night of the Long Knives. 
As you see on the one of the pictures here, I have a picture of Mr. Uh, Ernst Röhm. He was the leader of the Sturmabteilung, the SR. And the SR was, at least to some extent, the National Socialist Party's um, military unit. He could not have Mr. Röhm sitting there any longer for whatever reasons, but mainly for, power re for reasons of power and the distribution of such power. Mr. Röhm would expect some sort of gratification for his work, which was a problem to Hitler because Röhm was many things. Uh, apart from being a hoodlum, he was also a homosexual. He was many things that did not concur with the national socialist ways of life. And he aspired for more power. And he was a troublemaker. So what did Hitler do? He killed a lot. Practical solution. But this was in 1934. Note these years. We stay in Germany for a little while. What happens in 1935? Well, Shigeyoshi Matsumai leaves for Japan. Well, what happens in Germany? Well, Hitler reinstates Navy and Air Force. And that, this, is, this happens contrary to the agreements of 1918. He introduces the Nuremberg Laws of Race, of Racial Segregation. And they are passed on September 15th of 1935. You have a copy of it right here on the slide. What that means is, from now, now on, the crystal night is a possibility. You can, you can do almost anything as long as you got rid of all the Jews you can possibly find. So this enabled Hitler to act on a specific population, in this case the Jews, or others who were different from their definition of correctness. That is quite a context. And uh, 1935. That brings me to my last slide, but it does not stop my talk for a little while yet. I believe that there is some sort of connection between these dates, these years, and Shigeshi Matsumai's decision to leave Germany and go back to Japan. It may be that his focus has been entirely on education. It may also be, which I believe to be the case, that he has been grimly disappointed by what he saw in Germany and very, very enthusiastic about what he saw in Denmark as a comparison. He also mentions that uh, at quite a few occasions. He was interviewed in the 70s and he said that his view on, Ge on Germany back then was that Germany was one big machine. They could produce nothing but machinery and and technical minds uh, who could be programmed to do anything. Where in Denmark we had free spirit, free mind. We were not afraid to build up something bottom up rather than top down. And that was what he discovered as the main difference between Denmark and Germany. And that is really what he wanted to grasp to some extent and bring back to Japan. Now, why didn't that entirely happen? He's gone a long way, let's say that for a start. He's made so many changes in Japan. He's been the head of <laughs> virtually anything. He's been part of the new government. He's made a university. I haven't made a university. <laughs> I can tell you that's quite an achievement. <coughs> he has instituted uh, thoughts based on Christianity. Is that good or bad? Well, that depends on what part of Christianity we're talking about. But he has been focusing about on sorry he's been focusing on the message of love now the message of love and compassion is a message not often heard in other parts of, of the world as such so in a time where japan was lying down he saw ah denmark has been lying down he was referring to what he was told to denmark's defeat of 1864 we really had our ass kicked the Prussians came, they took us in a couple of weeks and really spanked us for being idiots, and with good reason. The thing is here, we came back, not militarily though. We came back in other, in, in other areas. We came back scientifically. We came back in developing a national identity. 
the thing here is that it has a sort of promiscuous sound to it when you say the words uh, national, because national can very easily be confused with nationalistic. And there were some quite uh, strong tendencies in this, in this aspect between 1848 and 1864. But if we were convinced that we were God's given, chosen people in 1860, we had no doubt that we were not in 1865, because we lost everything. We lost Schleswig and Holstein. We lost anything that couldn't be bolted to the, jet, to the table. <laughs> we lost a lot. And we lost our dignity. What do you do when you lose your dignity? Well, as it was very, very kindly and very precisely put by Dr. Enrico Dalgas, who, uh, amongst other things, helped uh, create new farming ground in Jutland, uh, he said, what we lose on the outside, we must gain on the inside. Which means, whatever we lose mentally, externally, in our terms of foreign policy, we must gain internally as a people. We must come together, hold each other's hands and say, oh, we're strong enough. Just come on. We're not interested in militarily stuff. We're interested in building our country. So piss off. We're busy doing things. And that is more or less what happened. What also happened was that it gave way to the development of a Danish culture society, um, free thoughts with a power that hadn't been seen in, in mer many other places in Europe. So we did not have a physical revolution as they did in many other countries, but we definitely had a cultural revolution of some kind. And... Uh, that is what I think what he wanted. He saw very clearly the parallels between a country once large and grand, now lying in the gutter, rising, building a, a, a phoenix bird of culture, coming back with a ve not with a vengeance, but coming back with new energy, developing a new identity, pointing to the others and say, "Ha." We could do it, couldn't we? And that is more or less what happened in Japan. We had a Japanese uh, business wonder happening from straight after World War II and up to the present day. They've been the forerunners of virtually anything you can think of. Right now, they're being heavily competed by Korea and by China, not the, lay, not the least. But that's the ways of the world. We can always discuss whether you, when you have a situation where you impose upon your people to work harder, what if they can't work any harder? That sort of sets the limits for economic growth. But this is where Grundtvig comes back to mind, because working harder is not the issue here. Working smarter might be the solution. And what does that mean? It means bringing back the person, the individual. And that is where Mr. Matsumai, Dr. Shigyoshi Matsumai, and Gondvi had many things in common. Matsumai wanted to use the collective for the benefit, for the benefit of the individual, as did Gondvi. Gondvi's primary thought was the individual. Individual freedom to think, say, and do what you want, exactly what you like, as long as you don't hurt any other people. And those were his conditions and his precognitions for, for existence. And I believe that is what Dr. Shigyoshi Matsumai wanted to take with him back to Japan. Has he been, su been successful? Yes, to a certain extent he has. Is there a long way yet to go? A long way. Since Japan is not a super tanker. Uh, Japan is a mega tanker. It's a huge ship that you have to direct and steer in another, in another direction. And doing that culturally without, without the cost of the culture itself is a very, very d difficult endeavor. Um, I wish them all my best and all the luck in the world to do so. And I think they will prevail eventually. And for me, on my part, I would love to be a part of it. Um, so, over there at the Tokai University, I bid you farewell. And I say, arigato, for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I will look forward to elaborate this uh, on a person-to-person -person basis.
thank you. This has been a presentation of uh, White Closet, and of course, as always, relentlessly, behind the camera, mobile video and Paul Goimke. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>